Hello, DevCon 2011. Yeah, I'm excited. I'm glad you guys are making sounds because I was really expecting like a bunch of half asleep people, kind of drunk, kind of time to get over it, but like I want to see this talk. Um, so I think I'd like to start off with I don't know if you guys um, read the proto lol jokes, and so this is kind of, I mean, even for DevCon, a little over the top nerdy, but. I'm going to start with a joke. Uh, so <clears throat> an IPv4 address walks into a bar and says, I'll have a strong glass of cider. But the bartender says, we're exhausted. <laughs> oh, it's, so ter it's so terrible, it's great. Um, good gosh. Can you guys hear me well? All right. Well, then let's get this party started. <clears throat> Sweet. So hi there. My name is Eric Fulton. I work for a consulting firm called Lake Missoula Group in beautiful Missoula, Montana. I know you guys are thinking you guys, you know, have public transportation in Montana. Yes, we do. And we also have hackers up there, which is a lot of fun. So we can uh, hack in the morning and hike in the afternoon, as I like to say. Uh, I also help run ForensicsContest.com. Uh, we actually run a network forensics contest puzzle during DEF CON, which is pretty sweet. Uh, and packets are are important in doing forensic analysis of a, a lot of different things. So I'm also uh, on Triscuit.com. I really don't update it ever. Um, so <laughs> I guess that's not as useful. I'm also on Twitter. And I'd really like to say during this talk, uh, thank you to Sherry Davidoff and Jonathan Hamm. They are absolutely amazing ninjas with packets. Uh, and they are actually writing a book, and I was able to help, or well, use their uh, an advanced copy of their book to to do some of the analysis that I'm going to kind of show you guys today. So, uh, what I'm going to show you today, I'm going to start with uh, some definitions, a testing methodology, uh, kind of go into how I analyzed the packets, what I was looking for, how I was, uh, what I kind of found, some fun findings that I found throughout all of this, and then kind of kind of come to a conclusion. Now, um, in addition to this, this talk is kind of threefold. Uh, I've got a, a bit to cover, so I'm going to talk a little bit fast. So I apologi or apologize if I'm going a little bit of a rapid pace. But what I'm trying to cover here is, is some distinct topics. Privacy, uh, especially, I mean, obviously, it's in the title. Um, because privacy in our lives is, is important. I think that our privacy that we have is eroding, and we don't exactly know what's happening. A lot of you have an Android phone, probably not in your pocket because it's DEF CON. But maybe at home you've got uh, a smartphone and you don't realize that every day it's leaking your location, where you're at, and some other, some other interesting facts. Uh, so that's definitely something I want to cover. I also want to touch a little bit on network forensics because this is what I use to help uh, discover what's being shared over uh, your Android phone. And uh, I mean, that's, and that's, that's the majority of it. So I've got, uh, it's, it's a wide breadth and it's kind of shallow. And if you want to know more about um, kind of the analysis that I did, packet forensics, I'd highly suggest that you, well, our contest is over, so apologies if you're just finding out about it now, but we, we run it online and we've got our uh, archives of past contests. I'd recommend you take a look at those, you kind of teach yourself or, or try and teach yourself some, uh, some network forensics, and it'll give you um, kind of a, a new perspective on, on how to, to analyze things. So what is network forensics? Now, the Wikipedia article says, network forensics is a sub-branch of digital forensics relating to the monitoring and analysis of computer network traffic for the purpose of information gathering, legal evidence, or intrusion detection. But basically, it's sniffing packets on the wire. You've got traditional forensics, which I'm sure a lot of you uh, know of, where you take your hard drive, you DD it, you make an image, you analyze it, you try and say, hey, what's on this hard drive? But there's also network forensics, and that's where you're going, what is going over the wire? What is my computer leaking? What is going on? I mean, with, with traditional forensics, unless you pull the memory, you won't ever realize that there's something loaded in memory leaking any number of things. And so listening on the wire gives you uh, a different perspective, and it lets you really understand uh, what e your phone, your laptop, your server, et cetera, is, is really sharing with, with your network in the world. Uh, or network forensics could be doing uh, called listening to the wire for fun, Question mark, question mark, question mark, profit and lulls. So, how network forensics affects us? You could say, I mean, assuming you're at DEF CON, uh, all of us use network devices. We use laptops, phones, et cetera, et cetera. And everything is network based. I mean, it, back in the day before the, the advent of the internet and the beauty that is 
network communications, people just had kind of a, a solid or uh, uh, solidarity, uh, sorry, excuse me, they had a, a single computer that wasn't really connected to anything else. Everything you did was on that terminal. Uh, but now we send all sorts of things to everyone. We send usernames, passwords, hashes, URLs, lolcat pictures with your grandma. Uh, I was going for laughs on that one. Sorry, it's Sunday at 10. I should probably cut the humor. Um, yes, but he laughs. Uh, but we send all of these amazing things over the internet, and we think to ourselves, oh, I am sending my password to this service. And a lot of people don't think of all the externalities that affect that. When they, when they pass, I mean, when I, when I log into Twitter, for example, most people think, oh, my computer, Twitter, that's all that's happening. But they don't realize that they're going from their most likely laptop, iPhone, iPad, iDevice, etc., to probably a wireless router, which then connects to your ISP, which then is routed over the internet to Twitter servers. And along there, whether or not I have access on your actual computer, I might have access to your network traffic. And through that, I have access to a lot of fascinating information. I mean, no one wants to be handing out usernames, passwords, or anything else. And a lot of companies are really good at, at protecting that. That's why we hash our passwords. But, but the simple fact that I'm able to look at that is, is, is a huge, not only privacy risk, but a security vulnerability. So some of our applications send licensing, registration, UDIDs. Um, and all this, all this data can be filtered, logged, and analyzed by third party. You don't know what your ISP is doing. Uh, most people just kind of sign that contract and assume that the ISP has their best interest at heart. But, and, and, and I'm not saying that ISPs can be evil, but if they wanted to be, there's a good chance that they could do a lot of, lot of damage. Or your roommate, who also is on your wireless network, could do a lot of damage, assuming how close you are with your roommate, or the guy next door if you're using web. Um, so essentially what I'm trying to say is there's a lot of ways our phones could fuck us. Um, what, I, what I really am specifically focusing on is Android application security because a lot of people have done the computer thing, uh, a lot of people have done laptop forensics analysis, et cetera, but something that we don't realize is we've got this essentially supercomputer in our pocket. I mean, when I first had my, my first computer, and I'm not going to say what that was, but it's like a tenth of the processing speed of my current phone in my pocket. Well, in my room because it's not on. Um, and people don't realize all of the fascinating things that they have on their phone and what, and what their phone knows. So we look at it, and, and if someone wanted to, um, I mean, our phones have a lot of things. If you're doing uh, GPG encryption and uh, trying to decrypt your phones or your emails, I mean, that's assuming that you're a naturally secure thinking person. Let's say you encrypt your emails and it's on your phone. You have to have your private key on your phone to decrypt your emails. If you're not a, a private thinking individual or a secure thinking individual, you just, you're sending your emails over your network connection. Uh, you have emails, usernames, GPS, et cetera, et cetera, and more. And so when I first got into this research, I thought, oh, you know what would be really cool? Let's build an evil application, right? Like something, something that would be like a back orifice for phones, which I think some other uh, presenters at DEF CON have actually done, which is awesome. Um, but when you, when you make that application, it's, 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 it's ultimately silly because as long as you can get the user to press OK, uh, done, right? I mean, how many people with smartphones scroll through their phone and they're like, I want to play this game. Scroll, 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 OK. I mean, I don't know if you guys watch South Park, but that's what the, there was a whole episode on the human centipede where someone didn't actually read the EULA. Oh, God forbid someone read 39 pages on a short level of, of dense legal text. That doesn't happen. And so anyone can build an evil app, put it on the market, and say, hey, you should download this. And anyone could execute it, and it could, it could export a lot of bad information. And we know this is bad, right? Um, there's a lot of companies out there that do a lot of great things trying to prevent malware, evil applications, etc. But then I got thinking, you know, OK, so we know evil applications are evil. But what about regular applications? I mean, when you get your Android phone, you think, oh, OK, first thing I want to do, I want to stream music through Pandora. Right? I mean, it's really awesome having an unlimited internet radio station on your phone. And then you play with it a little bit longer, and then you're like, oh, sweet, I've heard about Angry Birds. Who here loves Angry Birds? I'm not going to lie, I use it. You're sitting in a meeting, you're sitting in your office, you're on the phone with your boss, and you're just playing. Um, not that they know you're playing it, but the fact of the matter is, you're thinking, all of these apps, I've paid for it uh, or not, um, but I've downloaded from the Android application market, and it's a game. What I've downloaded is a game. But what you do don't realize is you've downloaded a little, a little spy in your pocket. 
Now, some previous research has been done by the Wall Street Journal and by a man named Aldo Cortesi. And I'd like to meet this man. He's done a lot of great things. Um, but basically, I was, I, mean, I was even going to call my original presentation Enjoy the Spy in Your Pocket. Turns out Wall Street Journal, been there, done that. Uh, they've done a lot of great research seeing what these applications are sharing uh, and, 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 and how they're sharing it. And so to get back to the, kind of the, the privacy side of it, um, in, in terms of privacy, we don't realize how much we share about our lives. We think, you know, all these companies have anonymized data. And one of the best examples is, is with uh, Apple. You have a UDID, I think. Yeah. Um, and it's basically an anonymized number that says, oh, I'm me, but I'm not actually Eric Fulton. It's just, you know, the company doesn't know who I am. They just know my number. Well, that's cool. But there's companies out there in the world where their whole idea is de-anonymizing who you are, like figuring out, oh, this guy that lives in Montana, that loves Doritos and Mountain Dew and also travels to these places uh, is this number, and they can easily tag it as Eric Fulton, because I love Mountain Dew. Uh, and so as part of this, I thought, all right, well, let's, let's start looking at these applications. These applications that I blindly trust that I think, oh, yeah, I totally believe these people. So scientific method to the rescue. What I wanted to do was create a reproducible kind of um, project that someone else could look at and that I could do with standards that would kind of display what our applications are sharing. So we've got all of the, the basic things there. And the question I asked was, to what extent do participants in the cellular ecosystem, so OS creators, app creators, carriers, etc., respect privacy? Now in my research, I've only gotten as far as Android, but I hope to get to Windows phones and to Blackberries and to iPhones. But right now, we're going to focus in on Android phones. So my hypothesis was, in terms of respecting privacy, what do they do? And I thought, you know what? Software applications and operating systems transmit your private information. I mean, to a certain extent, it's built in. That's what they're supposed to do. When you log into your Facebook, you kind of have to give Facebook your username and password. Um, but what do they give to third parties without your knowledge? What do they give to advertising partners? And more so, what are their advertising partners that these companies blindly trust connecting, collecting about you? And so I thought, I bet you they're sharing the standard you know, usernames and passwords and things that personally identify you. I mean, it's part of the application. But when you think about it, why does when you're searching for something on Google, why does Google need to know your location? And to a certain extent, for a business purpose, you know, it's helpful. They need to know that I'm in Las Vegas right now, and when I search for Batista's restaurant, they know, oh, restaurant in Las Vegas. But at the same time, I have no really real option of turning that off. I mean, I know Google says, hey, if you want to turn off your location data, your GPS, etc., we won't collect it. But what we don't realize, and what I found out later was, is that they kind of are, but to maybe not the, the GPS extent, to a different extent. So for this experiment, I built a lab. And for this lab, I want to install, use apps on the Android phone. I want to capture their packets, analyze these packets, and then profit, or at least give a DEF CON presentation. Um, <laughs> thank you. So I built a lab. I thought to myself, I've got this great idea. I've got this great hypothesis. What do I need? Well, I bought a Femto cell, an original Motorola Droid, a wireless router with DD Word on it, a sniffing laptop, and an internet connection. And I was like, I am ready. Turns out you don't need all that stuff to do this analysis. <laughs> As I went along, I found out I could have done a lot of it in the emulator, which would have taken nothing. <laughs> but it allowed me to buy some cool shit using the office company card. <laughs> well, thank you. I'm happy about it. Um, <laughs> so I bought the Femto cell thinking, all right, when I am using my phone, I want to collect the cellular network traffic in addition to the regular network traffic. Because I was thinking, you know, if, if I'm an app creator, I don't want people tweaking with my stuff. And generally, I'm going I'm to use the word generally, cellular networks are safe. Um, and so if I was an app creator, I'd be like, oh, oh, no, 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 no. I won't send sensitive data over Wi-Fi. I'll make sure it's over the, the cellular network because it's, it's a lot harder to tap. And so I was like, I'm going to buy a femto cell. I'm going to intercept that. Um, and then I bought an Android phone because I was like, this is cheap on eBay. And then I already had the router and the laptop and the internet. Well, it turns out 
after doing a bit of research, and I, I didn't delve too much into this, that app creators aren't that shysty yet. Um, all I had to do, I didn't even have to, to register for the, for the cell network. I was just able to pop up on my phone, turn on Wi-Fi, get to the Android market, and start playing around, which was absolutely great. So I created this amazing testing methodology where I would take the applications, I would purchase and install them, I would have initial usage, regular usage, and then uninstalling the application for each application, because then I would know what traffic's going on at exactly what point. And then during the uh, operating system tests, I would have first usage, so when you're first installing your phone, light usage, and then regular idle time, and then when I've reset the phone, right? I mean, it seems like I would cover just about every aspect of every application and the OS so that I would make sure I wouldn't, I wouldn't miss any shysties that went on. Because I thought to myself, you know, if I were an OS creator, every 30 minutes I'd want to know where you are at. Or if I'm an application owner, I might be like, hey, every 15 minutes, uh, who have you called in the last 15 minutes? Um, so this was my amazing original testing methodology. What actually happened was I just took a massive PCAP file for each app, uh, SSL stripped it, TCP dumped it, and made a drinking game out of it. In true DEF CON fashion. But you guys weren't hung over, so maybe that's not true DEF CON fashion. Uh, and so for the apps that I tested, I thought, all right, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do a mix. Um, I'm going to do Angry Birds, uh, as I used earlier, this really sketchy Chinese app. I don't read Chinese, and I was like, well, that looks sketchy. <laughs> uh, it's kind of my, my sketchy test. Uh, and then random applications that no one uses, so I, like, I scrolled a whole bunch of pages down. I got the main ones, Facebook, I got just browsing the web on Google, and that actually actually uh, happened by accident, but I found some fascinating things, so I decided to keep it in. Uh, IntelliPilot, which is a, uh, if I, uh, an airline pilot's app application for using logbooks. Mousetrap, which is a game. Pandora. Redphone, which is an amazing application uh, created by Moxie's Marlin Spike, and if you guys don't know of this, it's a, it's a little app on your Android phone that you can have secure conversations with other people. Uh, and I thought, you know, I like Moxie, but I kind of want to see if he's doing anything there. We'll, f <laughs> we'll find out more about that later. Um, and then Words with Friends and Zynga Poker, because I'm absolutely addicted to Words with Friends. Uh, and if any of you guys play Scrabble, you'll know. Uh, yeah, and, uh, I, I digress. Um, and so it's, it's obviously a work in progress. I have a lot of applications I'd like to test. I have a lot of different operating systems I'd like to test. And... Um, basically, what I've been trying to work towards is a standard methodology so that I can kind of hammer through it when I'm not working, which seems to be rare. So what I have to work with is a bunch of PCAP files and SSL strip outputs. <coughs> and the reason I did this was is because I figured, you know, if I'm an attacker, it's really easy just to run SSL strip. So let's just assume SSL is useless. Uh, and so I decided to take all the information that if someone were attacking you or if they were a corporation, et cetera, would have. Now, later on, I want to see absolutely everything sent back to the company. I'm going to add a root certificate to the phone and just collect all the information. But for right now, I've got a bunch of packet captures and SSL strip outputs, and that alone has proved very interesting. So let's start analyzing. With each packet capture, I, uh, I first peered around with it in Wireshark. I analyzed some of the conversations, some of the IPs being addressed. I ran strings, ran grep, pretty easy Linux stuff. Uh, and then I did some DNS play, and I did some Argus flows. So first, Wireshark. If you guys haven't done any uh, network analysis, Wireshark is kind of the de facto GUI tool. It's really nice just to kind of poke around and scroll, and you can just visually look at and see, oh, this is HTTP traffic, DNS traffic, et cetera. And it's a good starting point, kind of give you a feel for the lay of the land. Um, but command line tools are more powerful. And so I moved to T-Shark. And so I wanted to basically read the packet captures, look around, see what was happening. Uh, look at some of the hex, what's being talked to, and, and the conversations that are happening. And so I ran T-Shark. It's up on there. And I tried to see what are these applications talking to? Who are these applications? Who, I mean, who are these applications talking to? What services are they using? Who are they sharing it with? And then I who is like a mofo. So. If we were to take one specific example, we can look at Zynga. Uh, how many people here know who Zynga is? Oh, nice. So well, I, I should assume this is DEF CON. You guys are smart. Uh, and to reader, for those that didn't raise their hands, Zynga is kind of the new mogul, if you will, for Android games. Most games on Android and uh, Open Faint on Apple, or yeah, I think it's Open Faint. I'm, in any case, Zynga, Zynga makes a large number of those idle time games. 
those those games when you're kind of sitting down, as I started stated earlier, uh, and you're just kind of, you know, you don't have anything to do, and you want a game that you can play for five minutes, or you're on a conversation, and you're a little bored, you can play for five minutes, and they're wildly popular because people have a lot of idle time. And so I took a look at Zynga, and I was like, who is Zynga talking to? Well, if you look at the screen, and I'm not going to read each one out, there's a lot. There's TapJoy Ads, Midas, TapJoy Ads, uh, Facebook, 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 um, Facebook, Macromedia, Adobe. And when you look at this, there's a couple on there that you're curious. I mean, this was for Zynga Poker. And so you're playing poker on your phone, and you don't really expect for it to call out to Midas.mobi. What does this company do? What does MKHOJ do? What does TapJoy ads do? What information is being sent to these third parties that you have absolutely no idea? And this is where we draw in on the privacy element. When you downloaded that application for poker, did you really understand that you were going to be sending your statistics, your Android version, your location potentially, to Zynga Poker? And why do they need to know it? So this kind of, like, this really begs the question, what is being sent on your phone without you knowing? I mean, now, I mean, now that I brought the question up, you guys are thinking like, oh, what apps do I have? Well, one of the easiest quick and dirty ways to look at uh, a packet capture file and seeing where it goes is strings. Strings just basically outputs text strings that are inside the packet capture file, or any file for that matter. But basically what I did was is I looked for interesting things. And you'll see on here, one of the first things I did was the um, HTTP trying to see what websites are being contacted. And then I had a couple key phrases. And I did this for a couple reasons. One, I don't want to have to go through every packet capture file trying to figure out what password was what and what I was going through. So I made some basic things to look for. I made woot defcon my password. And I made uh, my username droid.net.foren at gmail.com. And for those of you thinking, oh, he left the password and he just displayed it. I'm going to go log in. Yeah, I did. I don't care. Um, <laughs> have at it. And so basically, I'm not using it anymore. Um, basically, what I did was is I, had, I put these kind of like little like these cookies within the packet capture file so I could instantly group for, grab for it. Woot Defcon, right? Because I was so excited this was coming up. I was making my password that. And I could instantly see where my password was shown. I could instantly see, rather than trying to figure out what's their password field called, or is it in their get parameter, their post parameter, whatever, I can just go, is Woot DevCon going over the wire? I also did it for my email address. Well, when we look at it, Woot DevCon is definitely going over Facebook. Obvious. I mean, you have to log into your Facebook to actually get the alerts that you want to see about your best friend and their update on how they're so excited for it Friday. Um, but, what we didn't realize is, is that Facebook, Words with Friends, and Zynga pa uh, uh, Poker are all sending my email. Again, something to be assumed. But, but beyond that, uh, any attacker can capture this. And this, is, and this is where I really tie in the privacy element. And this is where privacy kind of intercedes with what I'm doing. So we have it to where, as an attacker or as a man in the middle, I now know potentially your password for your Facebook, your Facebook URL domain name, um, etc., all because you're playing poker. I now know potentially where you're located, potentially what you're doing, potentially where you're at. And so when we delve in with words with friends, we can see a lot of very interesting things. And so this is an output that I, I got from running strings on words with friends. And again, this is, all, this is all very simple stuff. I mean, I'm not doing extremely advanced packet analysis, but if you guys would like to know more about that, I would highly recommend the Network Forensics Contest. But this is, I mean, this is quite simple. If you, if you have a, a Linux VM or a Linux box, you can all do this. And so I ran strings on the capture file that I had, and I, and I found this. I found Words with Friends is sending a couple of interesting things. One, they're sending the network that I'm on. So they know whether I'm using AT&T, T-Mobile, Verizon, et cetera. So now they know that my phone is Verizon. They know that, well, and, and they know that I'm a millennial, which I found was kind of weird. I think they're guessing. Um, but they also know what my build version is for my Android. They know what uh, app server I'm using, which I'm guessing, and, and, and some of these are hypotheses and some of these are fact. Uh, but on this, I'm guessing that they know where I'm located based on my, my uh, distance to the ad server. They know what screen resolution I'm using, uh, what language I'm using, etc. 
And for my testing, some of this didn't quite um, show up because I hadn't fully set up the phone, so they weren't able to send a couple of things because I didn't have anything in there. Um, but it, it, it definitely lets you know what they're, what they're sharing. And so when we continue on, okay, well, they've got my email. They also have my device ID. They also know that my last word was about, and I got 18 points for it. Um, but that's to be obvious. Again, sorry, I, I thought jokes would go over better at 10 a.m. Uh, but, but in any case, so they know the, the timestamp of when I'm accessing it, they know my email, they know my device ID, etc. And what's important about this? Well, I can only assume that my device ID is only my device. I can also assume, or I feel safe assuming, that Zynga has a number of different applications, and in every application, they know that my device is using that. They know that I'm using their game one, two, three, and four. But then we tie this in with kind of a larger ecosystem issue, is that advertising is kind of the, I, I would almost argue, one of the largest eroders of privacy, because they want to know as much as possible. They want to know exactly who you are so they can market directly to you. And so we take it from Zynga and we move to a higher level of the advertising agencies that Zynga uh, leases out. Well, now that they have my di device ID from Zynga, they can also tie it in with maybe if I'm at a website, if they can pull my device ID. Maybe if they're elsewhere, they can pull my device ID. And then all of a sudden, they can tie all these disparate, disparate pieces of information that I never really thought someone else would be collecting, and they're starting to put it together. Now, continuing on the theme of strings, and, I, and this is the one that I, I had no idea and I really do not appreciate, when you, on your Android phone, go to Google, and if your Wi-Fi is on, Google instantly knows, and it sends back to home all of the Wi-Fi access points around you. These are the people that live around me. They're creative people. Uh, I mean, and how many of you knew every time you're going, oh, what's around me? I want to Google for something. Boom, open up a web browser. Oh, my Wi-Fi is on. Oh, Google actually knows all the Wi-Fi access points that are um, beaconing, right? No one really thinks of this, and they think, oh, oh, well, that's fine. I mean, what's some Wi-Fi access points? But if you guys have heard of Skyhook, what Skyhook basically does is it uses Wi-Fi to geolocate people. And Google's trying to essentially squeeze Skyhook out of the market, or at the very least not pay them, because they're going, okay, so if you're at this location and these wireless access points are around you, if you're using an application and you can see, also, like if someone else is using this application and they can see this Wi-Fi, they also know where you're at. And so you don't even have your GPS on. Let's say you're a super paranoid person. You're like, no, 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 no. My GPS is off. Google will not find me. Well, now they know what wireless IPs are around you. They also know, because of those wireless IPs, exactly where you're located. Kind of scary. What's also sent to uh, Google, and I totally, totally anonymized this, um, the Xs are me because that's at my exact address. I, 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 uh, I was looking through the captures, and I was like, devlock? What's that? Is that like the, uh, my, my, my phone is locked? It's actually device location. And when I have my GPS on, and I am browsing to Google, and mind you, I am just browsing to Google, they instantly know where exactly I am, pinpointed to a, a dot. I, I kid you not. It's, it's, I mean, I remember back when GPS was kind of sketchy, you'd be like, oh, you're in this area. But they are, you are standing right here to that many X's worth of latitudinal, latitude and longitudinal lines. It's scary. They're also sending a bunch of other information that I haven't decoded yet, but I plan on looking through. But at the same time, I mean, there's a lot of easy stuff to be picked out right away. I mean, why does Google need to know my specific exact location when I'm browsing? And, and again, you could say, oh, well, it's, it's useful because they need to know when you search for pizza, what pizza is nearby. Completely agreeable. But then we have to move a layer higher in terms of privacy. Well, because Google is collecting my location, who are they sharing it with? Who else knows where I'm located when I'm browsing for pizza? Do they share it with their advertisers? Do they share the time that I search for it with? And then you start to think, this is getting a little creepier. Advertisers now know when I've got a hankering for food or whenever I search something. They know where, or p potentially know where I searched for it at. They know what time I searched for it. And they can start to build a profile about you. And I, I mean, I personally, in terms of privacy, I think that we shouldn't have advertisers that know your most intimate detail without you even understanding what you're sharing. Google doesn't instantly say, hey, if you don't have your GPS on, we'll just send some Wi-Fi access points around you. If you turn off GPS location assistance for web applications, we're going to send your Wi-Fi to try and guess where you're at. They don't allow you to turn that off. 
we also continue through and we get a little bit more interesting information as well. We have the LAN MAC address, the WAN MAC address, the WL MAC address, and the LAN IP, what type of wireless you're using, what type of uh, protocol it's using, what the active wireless is. I mean, and I, and I could keep reading through it, and I just, just for no reason, Google knows how long I've been up, or how long the uptime's been on my device, the actual IP of it, the load average, et cetera. And may, might I reiterate that you know all of this just because I popped open a web browser. It's, it's, it's quite crazy, and it's insanely disturbing in terms of privacy because you think, why do they need to know this? Well, now we're going to look at why data is collecting. And I'm hypothesizing here. We've got advertising. We've got statistics because obviously they want to know, are you using your application, what you're using it for, et cetera. We have advertising. Uh, we have legitimate business purposes. So maybe an application needs to know what version of Android you're using, using so it's effective. We have advertising. Um, we have things that can increase the value of a service. So, I mean, it's helpful when you search for pizza that they search for pizza near you. We have advertising. And I hope I've made my point here as you guys have caught on. I'm repeating advertising over and over and over because advertising is, again, the number one reason why they collect this information. And maybe, and maybe they could collect it without advertising, but it's the number one reason that they use. Why do you need where you're located? We need to give you the correct ads. Why do we need to know Wi-Fi around you? Well, I mean, that helps us find your location, which helps you get proper ads. Why do you need to know my device version? Well, I mean, if we're going to run an, an ad on your screen, we need to know what resolution it's at. It's creepy. So in terms of, man in the, uh, of this, what about man-in-the-middle attacks? Traffic can be uh, intercepted. You can use SSL strip, exploits, et cetera. And so just from sniffing your traffic from you hopping on my Wi-Fi point, I know you haven't applied your latest carrier upgrade. I know you decided to root your phone and put gingerbread on it from a certain mod like community. I know exactly uh, what device you have, where you've been, et cetera. And to uh, hackers, this is all very, very fascinating information, right? If I know that you're using a phone that your carrier decided not to upgrade and that there are active vulnerabilities in it, I also know that I can screw you. I know that if I have one of the exploits probably released at DEF CON or that I made myself targeting the Shoals platform with or um, against Gingerbread, I know I'm going to have 100% effective rate. And I know this just because you're playing Angry Birds on my wireless network. Or, not that I've done this yet, uh, <laughs> you, you uh, happen to be within a certain foot range of my femto cell and are on my cellular network. But that's a whole nother talk. Um, and so I kind of want to go back to the original question I asked. To what extent do participants in the cellular ecosystem app creators, OS creators, carriers, et cetera, respect user privacy? My answer? Not very much. And the reason for this is that no one's really called out for it. And I don't mean to wax too poetically. I mean, we're at DEF CON. I think a lot of people here really believe in privacy. We've got the Electronic Frontier Foundation who fights for our privacy. And yet, for convenience, we sacrifice our privacy. For the ability to Google something out of your pocket to run the uh, little location um, GPS on your phone to find out where you're going, to do any of these things, you're sacrificing your privacy. I mean, and that's fine. I mean, if that's something that you want to do and that you're comfortable with, that's fine. But myself, I don't like Google knowing my neighbors have very creative wireless access point names. I don't like Google knowing exactly exactly where I'm located when I browse a website. I don't like when I use turn-by-turn -turn navigation, Google knows exactly when I'm taking those turns. And I don't mean to pick on Google. They're, they're, they're just, they happen to have the phone that I was able to obtain. You can only postulate what's on an Apple iPhone, what's on an I, or a, a Blackberry, etc. And the greatest tie-in with this is that in terms of privacy, all of these companies, and, and let's assume a beautiful, perfect world, all of these companies believe in your privacy which is patently false, but let's say they do. Well, aside from that, what about the people that have access to your traffic? As I stated before, I did all of these, um, let, me, let me go back a little bit. 
I, I ran strings and collected all these packets so, so long ago on my own network. And I was able to analyze this. But how many people are able to write filters, put out a Wi-Fi point, put out a femto cell, and as soon as you walk by, you've instantly shared so much information about yourself? I mean, if someone walked next to you and asked to rifle through your wallet, what would you say? No, no, sir. But if you just happen to walk by a store and they happen to know certain details about you, they could change their advertising. Um, going forward, I mean, I, I, t t and this is, this is kind of near the, the postulation stage, all of this information is available. And whether companies are, and, and they're not protecting it, this is all sent in clear text. So if you were to hypothesize into a, a future where, and I hope I'm not giving these people ideas, this is just where my own head has gone. Imagine an idea where on your Android phone, it's sharing all this information. You happen to wander past a supermarket, and all of a sudden you're saying, oh, I really do feel hungry for Mountain Dew. I do really want some chips. I, I understand I just said hungry for Mountain Dew. I'm very thirsty for Mountain Dew. 10 a.m. on a Sunday. Um, all of a sudden I see an advertisement that says Mountain Dew, really cool. And I think to myself, oh, perfect timing. I'm going to get myself some Mountain Dew, right? But is that, is that exactly right? I mean, I may have bought the Mountain Dew beforehand, but it's almost an abuse of trust and an abuse of your privacy to take a look into your private thoughts and your phone and to share it out with the world. I mean, let's apply this towards politics. All of this information is bought, sold, and traded. All this information that's being shared on your phone that you don't quite realize. So all of a sudden, I'm, I'm someone in politics, and I'm like, you know, I want to be the perfect politician. Well. I've got these advertisers over here that are allowed on all these applications that you download and use. And you're like, oh sweet, I'm gonna use the free version. It's ad supported, rather than paying $1.99. But when you do that, you give away a little bit of privacy. It's not just you're giving away, uh, oh, I'm gonna ignore that ad. You're giving away your privacy. And they take this information, they take what device version you have, where you're located, where you've been, what you like to buy, what you like to search for, and they correlate it together. It's their goal to find out who you actually are. Because when these companies, these companies might have you know, your best interests at heart. They might say, hey, we, we don't collect your real name. But when someone else buys this data that's in your unique ID, they correlate it with other public data, and they kind of jumble it all together. They know who you are. They know where you live. They know your favorite color. And so taking this along the political idea, imagine a future where politicians know every constituent in their district. They know this because their cell phones are in that district. They know this because all of those cell phones have exposed what everyone does. They know what people search for. They know whether they read the Huffington Post or Fox. They know what percentage of people do this. They know what grocery stores you shop at. And they can take this data. They can take this data that's been correlated along all these different avenues. They can combine it and they can go, oh, hey, my district is 68% likely to vote Democrat or Republican. Okay, or no, let's, let's, let's even do something closer. It's like, oh, my district is 55% likely to vote Republican, but most of those people, like 10%, are not likely to vote, which means uh, I probably need to pitch myself towards the Democratic side. Okay, well, if I'm pitching myself towards the Democratic side, I see that most of the people on this side are value shoppers. They like to shop for the value brands. Well, now I shop for the value brands. I talk about value when I talk to my constituents. I make them think, oh my gosh, this politician is, m is me. I believe in them. I can, uh, I can affiliate with this person. I'm going to vote for them. But what they don't realize is whoever this person is, they have tailored themselves meticulously to look exactly like the person that these people want, or that, that these people are, that these people would want to see. This is, this is the power that correlating data has. This is the power that just using these applications on your cell phone by sharing out your device ID, your location data, the Wi-Fi access points, can share. So kind of tying back to my hypothesis, I said software applications and operating systems transmit private user information to the author or third parties without the user's knowledge and consent. So I mean, throughout this talk, I've stated personal data, identifying data, sent. Whether it's encrypted or not, it can be SSL stripped. And there was some data, and actually to, to talk um, a little bit, uh, I promised you a little bit about some of the applications I did. I did test Red Phone. I did take a look at, hey, you know, I know Moxie believes in privacy, but does he put his walk 
or does he, I mean, walk in the steps that he talks? And I actually couldn't intercept his traffic. Fascinating. And I was like, well, let's look into this. Apparently, Moxie, having broken SSL, knows how to secure his shit. And he does. <laughs> so it's definitely doable. These companies can make your information private. They, ca they can make it so that I can't intercept it on the wire. But the problem is they don't. They view it as not important data. Or, I mean, maybe not necessarily not important, but not sensitive. They don't take the time to protect it. They don't want to invest in servers so they can uh, encrypt it over the wire. And so I thought, okay, I mean, and even if they do, it's still exploitable. Facebook application. You can use SSL strip, username and password. Boom, done. Applications and usernames, passwords, contact lists, location data, usage statistics, timing of activities, and other content. Kind of give it away, I said they were. Uh, were we right? Yeah. Uh, we were right on all of those counts. All of them. And this is only using very basic packet analysis on these applications. And, and, and when I say basic, I, I didn't want to make this talk overly technical because I, I hope to make it a bridge between um, kind of the more technical field of network forensics and the non-technical field of privacy and kind of merge them together so that there's a little bit for both sides. But if you're a privacy advocate, I would highly recommend you taking a look at network forensics being able to look and see, hey, what are applications sharing? What are these operating systems sharing? When I go to Google.com, did I know my Wi-Fi access points are showing? Did I know my IP address is showing, etc.? And that was all with, with very, very basic testing. And so to kind of conclude, I don't think a lot of people realize your smartphone erodes your privacy, and you agreed to it. And that's the worst part. You agreed to it. It's allowed. And until people start saying, hey, companies, we don't want our information shared. You don't need to know the wireless access points around me when I'm trying to look for something, specifically even when I said I don't want location data shared. But the problem is you agreed to it. You scrolled through the pages and pages and pages and stuff and said, OK. And even beyond that, a lot of people don't understand the importance of the data they're sharing. They don't understand that when they're sharing this information, they're sharing it not with the world. Well, no, they are sharing it with the world. They're sharing it with everyone. And then they think, I mean, they just build it up. And they say, oh, yeah. well, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm starting to digress from my original point. Essentially, what I want to say is, is that information, what can be seen as, as benign information that companies collect can be intercepted. It can be taken by that original company. It can be correlated. It can be tied to you. And it can be used for nefarious purposes. And you should be aware of this. And if you're curious about more applications, what I'm trying to do is, I'm trying to build out from my original research. Uh, essentially, what I did was a very manually intensive, time intensive process. I am working on manually or uh, automating that process. I would like to have uh, an emulator that downloads and installs every application in the Android market, runs it through its paces a little bit, analyzes its packet capture data for passwords, other, yeah, I wouldn't say shicey looking information, but important information, and can go through each one. And that's what I'm going to be working on. What I'm also going to be working on, and, and what this has kind of, of, of hinted me towards, is advertising. It's, it's, it's this kind of nether region that, and, and maybe this is just me, but I didn't quite realize the fact that there are tons and tons and tons and tons of ad networks on every page looking at everything you do. And you might think, oh, OK, when I browse from Engadget over to Slashdot, there's, those are two separate websites. But what you don't realize is that one advertising company has a cookie or an ad on both of those websites. And they're able to see, oh, when he was done reading Ad and Gadget, he hopped over to Slashdot. This guy's a nerd. Uh, I'm going to advertise to him nerd products. I mean, and it's effective. And, and there's a reason they do it. They do it because it's more effective and they make money off it. And to a certain extent, I mean, having targeting advertising is useful. But to another extent, it's just, it just gets creepy because the way that the information can be used. And so in terms of, in terms of mapping out these, uh, oh, sorry. So in terms of all of this, what I'd also like to do is I'd like to map out these ad networks. I'd like to find out who's talking to whom, where are the servers located at, who has access to what information, and what can happen from that. So that's where I'm hoping to go. Uh, I hope I've shared a little bit with you guys, a little bit on the an analyzation of, of packet captures, finding out where your information is going, some of the information that is being shared. Uh, and I'm definitely going to be available for a talk in the Q&A room three. I've got a lot more technical data. 
uh, but I just kind of chose to to keep it simple for for you guys so I could um, kind of focus on privacy and, and the intersection of that. So thank you very much.